So I suppose it's been about a month since I said it last, so I better say it again. The stories or narratives we tell ourselves matter because they shape how we see and interact with the world, our community, and ourselves. I say this all the time, not just because psychologists have the data to back up that statement, but also because I've experienced it. And I believe the stories we tell ourselves have the power to shape the world for the better and for the worse. I think that's why I find Jesus' ministry so compelling and important. I haven't always been able to articulate this. In the past, it was more of a feeling that I could not put words to, but I can articulate what I find compelling about Jesus now. The story that Jesus enacts and teaches, which he calls the kingdom of God, is a story of what the world would look like, of, of what it would be if God were king. And this story, this vision, this description of what God is doing has the power to address the world's greatest needs and give life to every individual. Jesus will spend his entire life living out the kingdom of God and teaching people what it looks like and how to see it in their life. To do this, Jesus will use story and narrative set in the context of his culture to bring people into a new way of thinking and being and to help them experience the presence of God. Our focus text for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter. On one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so, in our focus text today, Jesus, who is attending a meal, witnesses how all of the guests are competing with one another to secure for themselves the best seats, the places of honor. Seeing this, he, he tells a parable, a story meant to challenge popular assumptions. Jesus' story borrows from the setting he finds himself in. However, he changes the occasion to a wedding banquet and proceeds to tell a story of a great reversal where the exalted are humiliated and the humiliated are exalted. This story, this parable, is not just wise teaching meant to help one avoid embarrassment. This is, this is not Jesus' self-help guide to avoid the top 10 social faux pas of meal etiquette. And this story can't, or I guess at least it should not be reduced by modern Christians into a rule or an ethic that can fit on a bumper sticker or can be tweeted to say something like, practice humility. No, this story is something bigger than all of that. In order for me, or in order for what I'm going to say to you to make sense, you need to know something. In first century Palestine, as well as in the larger Roman Empire, banquets were more about status and power than they were about food. The triclinium, 
is an ancient equivalent of the modern dining room or even a banquet hall. It consists of three couch-like couch -like structures positioned on three sides of a low square table whose surfaces slope away from the table at about 10 degrees. Diners would lie on their left side to eat and enjoy all the food and entertainment that their host had to provide. Meals were an event, and they would last from late afternoon through late at night. Typically, nine to 20 guests were invited and arranged in a prescribed seating order to emphasize divisions in status and relative closeness to the master or the host. <laughs> in this way, meals and especially formal wedding banquets are about prestige, influence, power, and status. It is about elevating oneself. It's about competing with others for social capital. It's about outdoing others and outperforming others. It's about in making sure that your seat at the table allows you to have access to power, to politics, to money, in order to advance your family's name and general standing in the community. That's what this is about. And hosts could weaponize banquets by not inviting guests or, or placing them in lesser seats. And here comes Jesus. <laughs> at one of these events and tells a story to everyone in the room vying for power that in God's kingdom, in God's dining room, in God's banquet hall, the ones who have the most status are the ones who have the least going for them. It's the ones that are not at your table, <laughs> the ones that can do nothing to advance your ambitions or family name that are exalted. There is no way that this story, that this parable is received well. And this is why I am fascinated with Jesus. But, but here's the thing. If you reduce this message to some kind of moral platitude, like don't be arrogant or practice humility or something else that is very, oh, well, I don't know, cliche, it does not have the edge that Jesus' story does. And the stories that we tell ourselves, they matter because they determine how we see ourselves, others in the world. I have a story of my own for you. This last week, my family celebrated really what was the, the end of our summer. Emily is now back to work, school sports are starting up, and we're on the verge of being back into the structured chaos of the fall schedule. So we wanted to celebrate. We, we decided that as a family, we would go to what is Minnesota's only big amusement park. I think that's the right word. Amusement park, right? The kind with the, the, the place with different attractions and thrill rides and roller coasters, that, that, that kind of place. Anyway, apparently 100 million other people also decided that day that it would be a good idea to celebrate the end of summer by going to the same park. <laughs> now at first, I was okay with that. It was like, oh, I'm really glad that a lot of families can come together to spend a late August day together. That sentiment though, it lasted for about 20 minutes. <laughs> As the day went on, as the lines grew longer, as the sun grew hotter, I no longer saw nice families anymore. I saw competitors. We all wanted the same thing, and the farther back we were in the line, the worse it was. So we thought about strategies to employ to outsmart the competition. Which rides were we going to do? What order would we go in to, to get better placement? We walked faster than those around us, and when we would beat others to the line, it was a great feeling. <laughs> a small victory had been won. We had a more coveted spot than those behind us. But then, there were those people with bright yellow wristbands. They were not rushing around. In fact, they acted like they owned the place, like they had, that they had a special power no one else did, which was kind of true. 
These were the fast pass people who were set apart from the rest of us with a colorful wristband that allowed them to jump to the front of the line without waiting. I grew to hate the fast pass people. I became jealous of what they had and, and what I hated the most was the sense of satisfaction on their faces when they would walk right by those of us who have been waiting in line for what seemed like hours to just jump on the ride. Do you understand, in a world of competition, in a world of status, it is hard to see others as anything other than your competitors. And as your condition or status deteriorates, or is perceived to deteriorate, it makes it almost impossible to see others around you with kind regard. You can't help but see them as your enemy. It is one thing to think about this in the context of an amusement park, but what about something more serious? As our climate changes and weather patterns change, as rivers dry and water becomes less available, can we see our neighbors as anything else but competition? And if we can't, well, what does that lead us to? What about foreign governments and foreign economies? What about those in political parties that are in control versus those who are not? If life is status, if life is competing for the most resources, for the most power, for the most money, if life is about your place in the line, your place at the table, and gaining access to control, what does that mean for those who are last? those who are on the bottom? What does that mean for how we work together and for our relationships? What does that mean for how we see ourselves, others, and the world? So Jesus tells a story, a parable, that in the world God is bringing about, the kingdom of God, humility is central. Not because it is something that you should do, but because humility allows you to step back and see those around you not as your enemies, not as your competitors, but as human beings made in the image of God. God's table in God's kingdom will not be hierarchical. It will not be about status and power and control, but about mutuality, relationship, peace, love, and grace. And if you believe this story, it will change the course of your own story. <laughs> what stories do you tell yourself these days? Because the stories we tell ourselves shape the way that we see ourselves, others, and the world for better and for worse. So today, may Jesus' story become your story. And may it become our congregation's story that we might be a place that is life-giving and hopeful in a world that is obsessed with status. This is the good news that we hear today. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. After hearing our focus reading and the reflection on that reading, here are a couple of reflection questions that you can discuss with your family, journal about, or simply think about individually to help you take the story of our faith to a deeper level. So question number one, reflect on your life. How much of what you do is geared to advancing your reputation, social status, power, wealth, and your general standing in your family or community? Question number two, how often do you see others as a direct threat or competition to what you want? And question number three, do you struggle to live with humility? Why or why not?